if you're splitting up your energy in all different directions like here on the left then naturally you just don't really progress as fast as if you just focused on one direction right and this is very much if i change the label here the left side would be adonis and the right side would be nest hey guys welcome back to the channel in this video we're going to compare adonis js with nest.js these are two frameworks that i believe are sort of competing for um kind of the same space both of them are very opinionated they have a very specific way of doing things you know i think they both believe that something like express is too minimal and does not have enough structure or specifically does not have enough um, architecture that these frameworks try to kind of fix that and they also bring in their own uh, integrations their own ideas so let's talk about it so what i think i'm going to do in this video is i am going to create the same rest api you know crud create read update delete and then as i'm doing that i'm going to compare and contrast the experience between adonis and nest.js and before we get started i do have to clarify some things up front um if you've seen enough of the content from my channel you'll know that i have a very strong bias towards nest.js already so coming into it i already like nest.js um so you have to understand that i have i already have that bias second um in the adonis side we're taking a look at adonis js version 5 which as you can see is currently in preview um the reason for that is I think that Adonis 5 represents what the author ultimately wants to get to, right? That's It represents the vision of what he thinks this framework should be. Now it's not, it's not completely ready, right? It's not complete, it's not, it's not generally available. It is in preview, you know, basically alpha. So just keep that in mind. There's gonna be obvious parts here where you know, it's going to look like Adonis obviously is not good enough yet, but some of the ideas are definitely there. There's stuff here that I really like. There's stuff here that I don't like, and I'm going to cover that throughout the video. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, like I said, I'm going to build the same API um, on both sides, and I'm going to try and see, you know, I'm going to try and compare and contrast. I'm also going to be referencing the documentation often throughout this video because I do think part of the things... One of the main things you should evaluate when you're looking at these frameworks is the documentation. If the documentation is not good, it's not going to help you. You're not going to know how to build stuff. So it's important. And on top of that, it's also good to understand the different principles behind these frameworks. You know, even though they are sort of trying to solve the same problem, they have a very different approach. You know, Adonis is very much, let's try to build uh everything from scratch well not everything but most things whereas nest.js tries to reuse a lot of the things that already exist in the ecosystem so you'll see that throughout this video um and we're gonna see you know is that a good idea or is that a bad idea and we'll discuss all right so i think the first thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna compare the experience of creating a new project from scratch you know let's say you don't know anything about these frameworks how good is the documentation at explaining to you how to get started as well as the the code that it starts you off with how easy it is to to pick up so let's start with adonis all right so to get started with adonis i've got a terminal on the right side here documentation tells me that i should npm init adonis ts app and in the name of uh, my project which i'm just going to call adonis api Right away, it starts asking me, do I want an API server or a web application? I'm gonna go with an API server. Asks me the project name. Do I want ESLint? Let's do yes. Prettier, sure thing. Some quick impressions out of this. I really like that right off the bat, it, it asks you, what do you want? Um, there's some things that you can immediately configure. So I really like that and uh, the cli in general just looks very simple and clean i like that so it looks like it also already installed my packages for me and it says that it's created you can go in and start running that so what i'm actually going to do is um, 
let's go ahead and change the directory to that and then I'm just gonna open up VS Code. Now what I'm actually gonna do for this video is I'm gonna use this uh, VS Code extension called Peacock. Um, I'm gonna use this to assign a color to my VS Code window so that you guys will know every time I switch between the different code bases, uh, the blue one will be Adonis and then later I'm gonna make uh, the NestJS code base red. You know, just so you guys don't get confused when I'm switching around. So in the documentation in the left, it tells me that there's this command, a serve watch to start the application. Um, I also noticed that in package.json, it does have that dev script, which is the same thing. So I'm just gonna run that actually. And when I run that, it tells me that the server is on localhost 3333. And it gives me a basic hello world. Let's take a look at what's generating that. So this is actually coming from this routes.ts file under the start folder. It just returns an object and we get back our hello world on the left. All right, so simple enough. Uh, I think one thing that is probably worth talking about right off the bat here is um, notice that the, the thing it creates you is this very specific folder structure. This is, I think, where you're immediately going to see the difference between Adonis and Nest. Adonis has this very specific folder structure where it's divided by the different types of things. So for example, you know, there is a providers folder where all the providers will be. I do find that as a person who hasn't spent much time with Adonis, this seems to be a very heavy thing to start off with. Like all of a sudden there's all these folders that you have to know what, what things do go goes in these folders. Um, so there's a little bit of an immediate learning curve, but I assume once you play around with it a little bit, it probably makes a ton of sense. And as I click around here, there's definitely a lot of files here that just doesn't yet make sense to me, again, due to my lack of experience. But I assume it's probably something covered in the documentation. Um, one thing that I've heard about Adonis is, is that it's pulling a lot of inspiration from uh, Laravel as well as Ruby on Rails. So I think if you're coming from that world, maybe this stuff is actually very familiar to you. Uh, I'm coming more from the Express.js world, so it's not immediately familiar, but again, I'm sure it's something that's probably covered in the documentation. So that's the basic experience of creating a new application. You get back a, uh, a base set of folders and files. Some of them don't immediately make sense to me. This route one, looks pretty similar to a, a, an express route, right? You've got a get, a path, and then some kind of callback, and it returns an object. And we'll go a little bit deeper more into routing in a second here. But before we get too deep into Adonis, let's first switch over to NestJS and kind of compare and contrast what's the um, create an application experience like in that world. All right, so I got the NestJS documentation on the right this time and the terminal on the left. And it tells me that to get started, you first need to globally install the NestJS CLI. Um, and then you can use that to create a new project like so. I already have that installed, so I'm just gonna go ahead and create that new project, which I'm gonna call Nest API. So kind of similar thing, it generates a bunch of files for me. It asks me, in this case, it's asking me, do I want NPM or Yarn? I'll pick NPM. That's something that seemingly was not a question on Adonis. I guess it prefers NPM in this case. And NestJS didn't really ask me anything else. It just said, here's your application. You can go into it. So I'm gonna do the same exact thing. I'm gonna open up a new VS Code editor. And this time, like I said, I am gonna color this to be red so that you know the red terminal is NestJS. All right, so let's take a look at our dev script in here. Similarly, they have a start dev. It turns on the application and goes into watch mode so that every time you change your code, it'll refresh. And I know that this is running in localhost 3000. It is one thing that I wish they said in the terminal by default, which they don't. Uh, I just know from experience it's on 3000 but you know, pretty basic. There's a lot less folders in this case compared to Adonis. You just got your basic SRC folder. 
right a lot more simple i think to get started with you have a main.ts which is kind of just your basic entry point and then you got a module which has a controller and a provider and when you look into that controller that's where you'll see that the uh, hello is coming from this controller all right so there's not really much else to talk about on the nest side other than you know that's pretty simple minimal files and there's not much more to really explore it's pretty simple if you go into the documentation for controllers it does immediately start talking about how you can change the the string that you provide in these decorators to start manipulating the uh, the endpoints that these controllers starts hooking on to all right so right off the bat kind of just comparing them side by side right again lots of immediate files and configuration on the Adonis side whereas SJS starts out fairly minimal um, but effectively outputs you the same application right it's a basic hello world application all right so let's go ahead and do a sort of side-by-side -side comparison between uh, controllers in Nest and controllers in Adonis now the initial code that comes out with Adonis doesn't actually have controllers in it um, but if you read the documentation a little bit, it does go into saying that the routes file is actually not really meant to have that much logic in it. In fact, it's supposed to just have the route definitions and then everything else is forwarded to the controller files. Which, why don't we go ahead and kind of uh, build something on both sides so that you guys can see what I'm, what I'm talking about here. So in the Adonis documentation, it tells me that uh, they have a CLI command for generating new controllers. So let's imagine that we're trying to create user CRUD, right? I want to be able to create, read, update, delete users. Um, so with that goal in mind, let's go ahead and make our user controller. So it says I got to do node ace controller user. And by the way, ace here is kind of um, Adonis's own CLI as you can see that it automatically kind of comes with the application that's a little bit different from Nest.js where it tells you to install the CLI globally so that's one that's one small thing that I don't know anyone cares about but there it is it does tell me that the controller is created in this path so I'm gonna go there and it just starts out with an empty class. So I've got my controller, but to actually have things route to this controller, we actually have to go back into our routes file. And then we have to define some things here that would say, that effectively say for these types of endpoints or requests, it needs to go into our user's controller. So one thing to quickly note here is on the routing, that's usually where you would define your um, HTTP method so you can see for a typical CRUD on the left side here it looks something like this which I'm actually gonna go ahead and copy that uh, just so you guys can see a little bit better and I'm gonna go ahead and paste it over here on the right side um, and right off the bat this is actually something that I noticed when I first I was first looking into this was that uh, you guys see the red squiggly here those are actually typos in the documentation. These should all have async in it. Um, so that's a little bit disappointing, but I kind of give the author a little bit of a benefit of the doubt because this thing is in preview. So, you know, you can't expect it to be perfect. Um, so this is kind of how you would create, you know, your basic CRUD routing. This is probably similar to if you've used Express before, it looks very much like express now i'm actually going to change these to be users because that's the thing we're we're trying to create here right we're trying to create users crud um, right so if you're trying to make basic crud routing that's that's what it would look like and it's easy to, to think that maybe you should be doing the logic here right but the the way it actually explains it to you in the documentation is that the the routing file is meant to be as clean as possible it's meant to just route to controllers it's not necessarily meant to really do much more logic beyond that it can i don't think it prevents you but it, that's not the intention so for example you'll see in the the left side here for the way that we route routes to the controller is for example i want to be able to do 
I want to be able to route uh, get users to my users controller and you just do it like this instead of providing a callback you provide a string and this string represents a method inside the users controller so for example if it says user control that index that means I need to define a you know an index method kind of like here I'll copy this that's how that's kind of how the mapping works is based on the string that you provide it's going to map to the method in the user's controller so why don't we real quick run this and kind of just see it in action so in a, in a terminal i have off screen i did start the the application again which runs the application in localhost 333 and if i go to slash users what i expect to get back is this array that i have so from here you can kind of imagine that to do the rest of the crud i just have to do a bunch of these kind of definitions so for example if i want to do user slash id I might do something like let's change this to a user controller uh, get by uh, let's call it get one let's call it find one and in my user controller I need to define a find one method which let's just say we're returning um, Let's just return something with ID one for now for simplicity. So I expect if I go to slash users slash one, and later we're gonna look into how to parse this ID from the URL dynamically, but let's just hit enter there and I get back that user with ID one. Something that I immediately like about this is that you can see we're just returning, you know, arrays or objects directly, right? So there's no uh, if you're coming from Express, there's no doing like rest.json or something like that. It automatically tries to figure out all right, what is the um, what is the response content type, right? You can also return strings, and it immediately figures that out for you. So it it simplifies it really nicely. And this is also something that um, happens in Nest, so it's not completely specific to Adonis. One thing though that I'm not sure I'm a huge fan of is this whole thing with the strings. If you read the documentation and if I understand it correctly, the idea is that they're trying to make sure that um, one, the route kind of turns into something that you can just easily scan. So for example, let me do some cleanup here real quick. So the idea is that you can go into this routes file and at a high level, you can immediately see what are all my routes and then where, which controllers does it map to, um, which is kind of nice. I kind of like being able to have that high level view of like, what are all the routes in my application? Um, and we'll compare this with Nest in a second here. And just thinking out loud, one thing though that I don't like is that because we're using strings instead of actually taking advantage of you know typescript types in this case i can very easily make a mistake here like if i made this like you know gibberish let's just say i, I misspelled it or maybe i'd added an extra e here um it doesn't tell me that that's wrong it's not able to look into this controller and say that doesn't exist, right? And some of these I haven't defined yet and it doesn't tell me. One thing that I did notice is if I, let's say, let's add an extra X here. So that's gonna make it break. But again, it doesn't immediately tell me, it doesn't tell me in the terminal at all. Um, but if I go to slash users, then it does tell me, it, it'll say missing method index on user controller. So the problem there to me is that it's not gonna inform me that there's a problem until runtime, which I feel like if you're trying to use TypeScript, right, isn't that the whole point for TypeScript to kind of help prevent some of those bugs for you up front? Um, I wonder if maybe if I run build, does it tell me when I start building for production that I'm missing methods? And it doesn't seem to, it built successfully. So, I don't know that that's a design decision that I'm not sure I agree with. I do understand the 
the benefits to it. Um, I think in the documentation it says that because the mapping here is done with strings, it actually is able to lazy load the controllers in versus something like Nest where it has to load everything up before the application starts up. So you do notice this when you start Adonis, it boots up very quickly compared to Nest, but you lose some of that typing ability. So I don't know if really that's a good benefit. It's more of a stylistic preference, if you ask me. So while this is like really nice and clean, I'm not sure that it's really that good of a benefit of, yeah, you, you lazy load, but you, potentially easily introduce runtime bugs into your application. I don't know how I feel about that. There is also a shortcut to, cause this is probably a typical pattern that you do with CRUD. So according to the documentation, you can also do route that resource. Um, and let me do that and I'll show you what happens. So if I switch this to route that resource, looks like just users without the slash. And then we just change this to users controller. It looks like what that does is it, uh, uses conventions to automatically map it to specific methods. So if I do node ACE list routes, so it tells me that it auto generated all of this stuff. Well, it didn't auto generate it for me, right? I still need to define it myself on the controller, but um, there is a convention here that uh, slash users will automatically go to index and slash user slash ID will automatically go to users controller that show. So I should actually rename this to show. And just to do a quick test, let's go ahead and refresh on slash users. That still brings me back my array here. And if I do slash one, I get back this object. So that is kind of nice. I like that kind of, Hey, here's a convention, follow it. You know, and if, if everyone's following it, you kind of end up having consistent code. Um, so that's kind of nice. Well, one feedback I would have for the author is you, you got to build something in here that checks for, um, maybe missing implementation, right? Like if you meant to do resource, but you only implemented two of the methods, then you know what happens. All right, so that's one-on-one how to do basic CRUD routing in Adonis. I do think it's super clean, um, but I feel like there's still room for improvement. Uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, create the same exact thing in Nest.js and kind of compare them side by side. All right, so I'm back in my Nest.js app and from experience, I'm actually aware that they also have sort of a CLI command that helps generate an entire CRUD resource. So I can just go in the terminal and do nest generate resource users. And I hit enter here and it's going to give me a couple different options. I'm going to select rest API. It's going to say, do you want CRUD entry points? Yes, that's exactly what I want. And then it starts installing some, st it starts creating files for me. And then it also installed some stuff. So let's take a look at what got generated. In Nessa's case, it made me a users folder, which within that there is immediately a file for DTOs, which represent the shape of um, data that's being transferred around. There is immediately a user entity file, which is just an empty user class representation. Um, in a little bit here, we'll compare how do you, how, what's the difference like between nest and Adonis when it comes to representing a database table. So we'll explore that a little bit more. And then it specifically creates a new users module, which registers a users controller and a user service within the users controller. It has basically all it has a class that has all of the methods for me built right away. It's got, it's got the post, it's got the get, get by ID and patch for updating and then delete, right? There's all my CRUD endpoints and it's automatically kind of forwarding to the user service, which is where our implementation later on in this video will live of, all right, what's the underlying logic? Do you talk to a database? Do you, 
go somewhere else, whatever. And if I run this and go to the browser, kind of similar thing, if I go to slash users, you know, I get back a, a base, you know, mock implementation. This action returns all users. And if I do slash one, this action returns number one. So nice thing with this is it immediately has an example of how to parse out the, the parameter. Um, so we'll explore to, we'll explore in the Adonis side how to do that in a second here. Um, but right off the bat, I think there's some interesting things to kind of compare between the two implementations of the controller. We've got our Adonis controller on the left. We got our Nest users controller on the right, right? These are doing the same exact thing pretty much. And I tried to reorganize a little bit so that they kind of match one to one, right? So you have your, your create here on the left. You got create here on the right. We got find all, we got index, we got show and we got find one. We've got update and we got update and then we got delete. We got destroy and we got remove, right? So your crud on both sides. And let's go ahead and talk a little bit about, you know, what's different, what I like and dislike. Uh, and I did implement some of these uh, other methods, uh, which you didn't see just so that we can have a kind of a fair comparison here. I also added these, uh, I destructured the params, which is how you get back the ID. So FYI, at a high level, there really are basically the same thing. The difference is that again, Adonis says that your route definitions should live on this file. It should be, you know, as clean as possible in your controllers is just in charge of the logic. It doesn't have any information about the routing itself. It doesn't have HTTP verbs. Whereas in NestJS, it does say that the controller is in charge of being kind of the fusion between routing and what people often call as controller. But they're kind of in the same idea if you think about it, where in SJS, you also don't necessarily want a ton of logic to live in the controller itself. You actually want to delegate to the service. As you can see here, the generated code does exactly that. So a lot of the, a lot of the code that, uh, the core business logic in your code ends up living in the services. And you'll also notice later is this is where we're going to define our database queries. Whereas in Adonis, a lot of that logic oftentimes lives in the controller. And there is one problem to that, which is what about reusable logic? How do you reuse controllers? And the documentation does say that you're not supposed to reuse controllers if you have that sort of need to reuse logic, you should actually move it to a service object. You know, it says it's, there's a section here about reusing controllers and it says, if you want to reuse, move that stuff to its own service object. So it pretty much has the same opinion as nest. Um, it just by default doesn't enforce it, I guess. Um, whereas nest right away says, Hey, move your logic, your, your business logic into services immediately. That's where they have to live. Now, one thing to maybe immediately notice between the two is in nest JS, you'll very easily, uh, start noticing dependency injection and you know, where you're kind of seeing these, uh, constructor definitions and it has stuff in it that automatically get injected, you know, for example, uh, nest is behind the scenes kind of creating an instance of user service and automatically injecting it into this user controller, um, via the constructor, the constructor. Um, and some of the base ideas behind that is actually also in Adonis. Cause if you take a look around, you'll notice that their import statements, some of them have IOC in it which stands for inversion of control. So a lot of these imports that you'll see around the, the application in Adonis is actually, um, doing kind of the same fundamentals behind, um, dependency injection, right? Dependency injection is kind of a form of inversion of control. Um, but the way that Adonis kind of deals with it is kind of, it, it magically does it for you 
through this import strategy, which is actually really cool because it's sort of like the same as saying, uh, what if I can just import user service like this on the right, but automatically it, the framework takes care of providing me with the instance. I don't need to define a constructor like this where it gets injected. So it kind of magically, you know, makes it look like you're just doing basic imports, but it's actually doing inversion of control for you behind the scene. So that's something really cool that I like about Adonis. The thing that's not super clear, however, is what's the, what's the testing strategy, right? So usually when I see inversion of control or dependency injection in frameworks like this is that they, the, the big idea is that it makes testing easy because in tests, I can just, for example, on the right here, I can just create a different, you know, mock instance of the user service during testing. And this is actually something that is very well covered in the documentation itself. There is a section here under fundamentals testing, you know, you can read through this if you'd like, but it goes into how do you go about kind of utilizing the fact that they're using dependency injection and how do you override implementations in a test, All right? So you can kind of see examples of override provider. Now, now when I take a look at the Adonis side of things, uh, something that was super surprising to me is there's no documentation yet on testing, right? And I feel like that's the biggest thing with, you know, a version of control is to kind of help you with testing. So I would have expected that one of the primary things that should already be in the documentation is testing. So that's a little bit disappointing uh, that it's not already here. If I do a search for testing, there is a blog post about it on how to test set up tests in Adonis, which basically just goes into the author saying, I don't like Jest, so I'm going to use something else. Um, which again, I don't, I don't know that I would agree to because Jest is pretty amazing. Um, so they're using Joppa, uh, but they don't really go into detail about how do you, how do you mock things? How do you fake, how do you provide fake implementations for dependencies? So again, maybe it's, it's here somewhere and I just missed it, but, uh, something that I wish was already here to begin with. If you do go into the Adonis V4 documentation, there's some stuff there about testing and how to do exactly what I'm looking for. But again, what we're working with here is in preview. So I guess I feel like you could use that as an excuse for a lot of this stuff, but I don't know. I feel like that should be number one. If you want to be taken seriously, you know, you should have some, some solid testing documentation, right? If we go back to Nest.js, like look at the amount of detail that they have in here about testing. Um, you have to have that in my opinion, right off the bat. Anyways, I do again, think that this kind of invert inversion of control that just looks like a regular import. That's something that is, I've never seen that in any JavaScript framework. So that's really cool to see. I would love to see something like that in, in Nest.js, but again, some documentation on how do you go about sort of providing mock implementations for that, that would be great to add to the documentation. Now, if it was using Jest for the framework, if you know, Jest is really good at mocking imports, imported modules, but his blog post just pointed out that he doesn't like Jest. So how do you, I don't know, maybe I missed that detail. If you know how to do this stuff in the comments, you know, maybe let me know. But I do like the approach that it's trying to take where you can see that the files are meant to be kind of very lightweight, you know, it's just a basic JavaScript class. It's got none of these, you know, uh, decorators, uh, decorators are very heavy in Nest.js. Some people like that stuff. Some people don't, um, even things like you can see just getting, just parsing the ID out of the URL, you have to go through a decorator. Um, same thing with getting the body out in Adonis, you kind of just get it out of the request object like this. And actually just to kind of make this a more complete example, let's, let's go ahead and dive into parsing the request body on the Adonis side, because there are some, some interesting stuff to see there as well as validation. So let's go ahead and take a look. All right. So we're on back on the Adonis V5 
documentation and there's a section here about form submissions it talks about kind of its own body parser which is used both for um, you know parsing and validating but you'll see that it has support for a lot of things including you know your base JSON but as well as stuff like you know multi-part in the express nest world usually you would have to use something else for multi-part like you some of you might have heard of multer uh, people usually use that for you know file uploads and stuff but if you scroll down a little bit here it says that all right there is a, it's a middleware that you have to have and it, that is in the file already and after you have that registered you have access to these uh, request methods so you can see that the request is something you can destructure out of the uh, the object that you get in the method so let's take a look at how to do that so in the code say that we were trying to create a user um, looks like we get back here in an object of some sort that has uh, this type up here HTTP context contract and within that I've got my request so to get the body you can do something like request dot all right and to kind of just test this out why don't we go ahead and just return the body back right so whatever we push into it it's gonna return back to us so i'm gonna open a insomnia on the right here it's it's kind of like um, postman if you've ever used that it's just an alternative. So let's say that we're trying to do a post on slash users. And I'm going to have a JSON here that has name test, right? Pretty basic. So I expect that I'm going to get this object back when I hit send here. Uh, this is actually telling me that this method should be store, not create. So let me update that. And let's hit send again. And now I get back my test. Real quick, I had to go back to the documentation here to see why did I think that was create. Um, and that's because there's actually two extra routes when you do route that resource, which is meant for a web application. Like if you have a, a form page where you can do the create, that's what where they do slash post slash create will serve up that page. Now, I don't actually want that. So I'm supposed to add this dot api only to my route config so that doesn't have that all right so we're just making a crud api and that's it all right so as you saw in the somnia test that's how we're able to get the uh the body out of the request and then the documentation to also tells me that uh you can do validation um, again, something that Adonis, the Adonis author, seemingly created is their own uh, schema validator. And this is a common theme that you'll see in the Adonis space is that they very often kind of take, basically they reinvent the wheel a lot is, is the easiest way I can explain it, right? Because schema validation is not new. There's a lot of stuff that already does this type of work like joy, class validator. Um, but in Adonis, the author very much believes that it's sort of like SpaceX, if you guys are familiar, where SpaceX, instead of trying to buy a bunch of expensive rocket parts from different manufacturers, they instead decided to just um, build parts themselves, which keeps the cost down, but also improves you know, the integration between their parts. So that's kind of the same thing that the Adonis author is trying to do. At least that's how I I kind of perceive it, is that they're trying to increase the, uh, they're trying to enhance the integration between these different parts. And they've the author, I think, has found that instead of trying to integrate with existing libraries, he finds that it's sometimes easier to just make his own, which um, I don't know if I, if I would agree with that strategy, I think that if maybe he has a team behind this, that would make a ton of sense. But he's he's one guy, I think, pretty much. Um, and he's trying to build all of this stuff. So I don't, I don't know. Anyways, before we get into a super deep rant there, let's 
let's do some of this validating stuff. So it says in the documentation on the right there that I can create a schema. Let's call this user schema. And you can do schema.create. And let's just say that I want to have a name in there, a required name, and that is a type of string. Okay. You can also validate the request off of that. So let's do kind of the same thing they're doing there. Await request.validate schema, provide our user schema, and then something about cache key. On the URL. All right. So, as you can see, I don't know a ton about this. I'm kind of just following the documentation. Um, so, you know, you can kind of assume that the experience that I'm having is going to be similar to your experience if you're, if you're new to it. So, uh, maybe that's useful to you. I don't know. Um, and then I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to return the, the validated data. And let's just kind of see how this works. So if I go back into insomnia, if I do a post, um, let's say that I just, you know, sent the wrong object. How does it respond? You'll notice that it gives back a HTTP 422 with an errors object. And it tells me that, Hey, name is required. So that's pretty cool. It seemed pretty easy. Let's go back to name test. And that should give me back my object. So that's you can see validation working. Um, one kind of random thing for me to nitpick here is you'll see that the documentation, you know, in an ideal world, this is something that can easily be copy and pasted, right? But you'll notice that there's actually an unused import here that I'm not sure why it's there. Um, it actually breaks the build. If you run the build, it's going to say you've got an unused import. Why is it here? So I don't know that to me just seems like a copy and paste error in the documentation. Again, I feel like this is in preview, so you can kind of excuse it, but you know, documentation in my opinion is key. If it's bad, it's I don't know. Uh, one thing that is cool here is this data that comes back actually has type definitions attached to it. So you can see that it knows that this has a name in it because the schema provides that. So that's kind of cool. What's weird to me, however, is that the request body has zero type definite. It has a generic object type of key and value, but that basically makes it useless unless you make it go through the validator. So I don't know, I guess you just have to always validate your body in uh, Adonis, which I would imagine is good practice anyways. All right. So that's how you do, uh, sending form data to a user's controller in Adonis. Let's take a quick peek at Nest.js on how to do that on that side. So I've got my Nest code up again here, uh, and also the, the documentation on the left side. Uh, Nest does have very solid documentation for uh, validation, and they do validation through what they call pipes and uh, to explain pipes simply, pipes are basically middlewares, except they're specifically meant for either validating or transforming data. So just think of them as like a, a special middleware that has a very specific job. And it does have a couple built-in pipes that you can readily use. So one of those is the validation pipe, which we're going to add to our application. So there's a section in the documentation here under auto validation, it just tells me that I need to register the validation pipe globally. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to go into main.ts and I'm going to add that piece of code right here. And you make sure to import it. And then when I run the application, I know this is actually going to tell me I'm missing something, but I wanted to show you real quick. It's going to say you need class validator. You need that package. So in another terminal, I'm actually going to do npm install class validator. And I know from experience that it also needs class transformer. 
So I'm gonna install those two things. Next, in Nest.js, you might have noticed earlier that we have this concept of DTOs. DTOs are basically, you can think of them as just classes that represent the shape of the data that's being transferred around. So in our specific example here, the request body, in the Adonis side, we said that we wanna provide a name which is a string. So this create user DTO just represents the shape of that request body. But the thing that we can add here now is you can do something like with class validator, you can do, for example, maybe you wanna do is um, alpha. We only want letters in the name, we don't want numbers. You can see that this create user DTO is being used in my post method here, right? The request body has a type of create user DTO. So just from that annotation, let's go ahead and uh, run this and kind of see it working in action. I'm gonna go ahead and open Insomnia again and let me create a new request for Nest API. And I wanna make that a post. Right, and this one is coming from, and this one is coming from localhost 3000 slash users. And we're gonna do the same exact thing. We're gonna provide a JSON body that has a name in it. And maybe let's provide numbers because we know that's gonna make our validation fail we hit send here, uh, kind of similar experience, right? We get back a status 400. Um, you might have noticed it earlier in Adonis, they sent 4, 422, I think, which is a bit more specific, I think, for this use case. But, you know, 400 is not a bad status code to send. But it sends, it has that same kind of experience where it sends you a list of here are your failing uh, validations, right? And if I set this up to be just letters and hit send, I get back my expected response, right? So that was pretty simple, right? Uh, if we again do a side-by-side -side comparison, uh, the big difference, right, is that in Adonis, the request body is not typed at all but you kind of feed it through the validator and the schema and that kind of enhances it to have a type. Whereas in Nest.js, it immediately kind of takes the request body and kind of transform it into an instance of this class that automatically, you know, has these properties and it runs um, class validator through these decorators to validate your, your class properties, right? So very different approaches. I didn't dig too much into the what else I can do here in terms of changing the, the schema, right? Then class validator, I think there's also a is string, right? So if you want to make it more of a one to one comparison, but again, very different approaches on one side, you kind of define a schema and run your object through it. Whereas in Nest.js, you define the shape as a class and you you decorate your your properties to have automatic validation. If you ask me, I really like the way that Nest does this. I feel like it's, I don't know, it's intuitive. This is intuitive as well in, in Adonis, but it's pretty verbose. Um, I don't know, one, one could also say that once you have a lot of decorators on this side on Nest, it also gets pretty verbose, but um, you're, I'm not calling anything like validating or I'm not doing, I'm not creating an instance of the class, right? That's all being done for me kind of automatically behind the scenes because I enabled that validation pipe. It's basically kind of doing the same thing as well as, uh, you know, it takes the request body, it kind of transforms it and then it validates it but I don't have to see it, it does it for me. So I never have to do this sort of stuff. Plus, the body is immediately has this type because of what we're doing here, right? So I, as I pass around that DTO, 
it always has that shape i know what i know exactly what are the different properties that it has um whereas here it seems like it you know request that all gives back a generic type which in my opinion is not as useful again you kind of have to feed it through the validator to kind of enhance it with types again different ways of doing the same thing i personally like uh the nest.js way better all right so th there's a couple you know there's quite a bit more stuff to kind of dig through and compare there's stuff that i don't think it's worth doing in code so i'm just going to talk about it kind of comparing the documentation you know so for example uh we didn't really cover views and templating um if you were trying to make a kind of server rendered ui you might want to look into this the gist of it is that basically adonis kind of created their own templating engine called edge again it's a recurring theme in this space is that the author likes to kind of reinvent things um to a degree i get the motivation behind it but at the same time i feel like it's a little bit too much in nest.js it does have the ability to kind of also emulate an nvc structure kind of like what adonis is trying to do um, but you can pick what templating engine you can use you know you can use handlebars you can because it's just using express by default and express works with all of the different templating engines like pug ejs handlebars i think there's one called mustache right so it's not it's not trying to reinvent that space it's just kind of utilizing what already exists whereas adonis made their own um whether or not you kind of agree with that that's up for you to decide file uploads kind of similar thing um you know adonis has their own way to uh because they're they have their own body parser that parser can also parse multi-part requests and the cool thing that i did notice here is that the same sort of schema validator that we use to validate a JSON body, you can use that same schema validator to validate a a multi-part request with files, right? So you can see here they're validating an avatar to have a size of two megabytes and it has to be one of these extensions. Um, so that's pretty cool. In Nest.js, if you look at their file upload documentation, um, they kind of take the uh, again, utilize what's existing in the ecosystem, which is Multer. So they have sort of a way for you to do, again, another decorator to get the file into your controller, right? You can kind of see you add this decorator and then it kind of just does its magic behind the scenes and feeds the file down into your controller. And from there, it's up to you what to do with that. You know, you can do your upload to S3 or something if you want. There's also sessions documentation here where you'll notice in Adonis, right? They have support for some initial uh, very basic options. You got your cookie, you got your file, and you got Redis. So they've got a pretty, I would say it's kind of limited, but maybe that's enough for you. I don't know. In again, in the Nest.js space, because it's kind of, think of Nest as a layer on top of Express, right? So it means that everything, almost everything that Express has access to, basically that entire Express ecosystem, which is huge, um, Nest very often also has access to it. So Express Session is a very good Express library that Nest can just take, take advantage of. And when you look into the documentation of that, you know, take a look at what it supports in terms of storage, right? Compatible session stores. It's got all of these guys, right? You can do, you can save it in databases. You can save it in DynamoDB. You can save it in uh, Mongo, Redis, basically anything you can think of is probably here, right? So wherever you want to store your sessions, more likely than not, it's already supported. Whereas in Adonis, you got these three basic options. Maybe that's good enough for you. That's up to you to decide. Uh, real quick, uh, let's also cover middleware. You know, I think middleware is a, a thing that's, you know, pretty well known in, in the Node.js land because of Express, but 
basically middleware is sort of like logic that happens between you know the the request before the request gets to the controller itself you might want some logic to happen before it gets there so that's usually what middleware does and you could take a look in adonis you can define middlewares as classes and then you can just register them globally i think like this in the kernel.ts and on top of that you can also in the routing add middleware there where in after the route definition you can do dot middleware and then you define your your logic there this one is a little bit weird to me because like in my mind i think of middleware as like something in the middle right i would have i feel like it would be nice if the api first did route dot middleware and then under it it had to get but i don't know if it, if that's possible i didn't play around with it but i don't know it's just weird to me to see that the middleware is at the bottom because technically this is gonna run first before it gets here right by definition of a middleware i don't know just a stylistic oddity to me um in nest.js they also have the concept of middlewares um and you can look into it kind of similar thing where you can kind of define a a middleware class and then you decide which routes does it apply to and you do the def you do the registering in the module right so for example in this example here they have a logger middleware that they want to assign to specifically the get cats route and what do i think about that i'm also not the biggest fan of this um i feel like it's not super intuitive to be defining the middleware in the module. I feel like that should be maybe in the controller, like where everything else is. One thing that I do like about Nest is they they kind of decided that there's certain types of middleware that has a specific enough job that we should just call it its own kind of type, right? So we talked about pipes a little bit earlier, which are effectively middleware that does transform and validation. There's also guards, which are effectively middleware that specifically has the responsibility of authorization and authentication. And then Nest just says, if you've got any other generic stuff, you know, you can do, you know, the old school generic middleware. All right, so that's a little bit about middlewares. I don't think there's much really more for me to compare there. So the, the gist of it is they can both do some form of middleware logic. Um, how you kind of define them and register them is just a little bit different, but uh, ultimately they, they can do the same thing. Uh, exception handling between the two is, I think, fairly similar again kind of same idea of there's usually the idea of creating a class which represents a, a specific exception right so the adonis docs kind of walks you through uh creating a custom uh, exception handler where you can see here they can do stuff like if the code is a certain type respond with this http value and you can also make these uh, specific classes that you know has this definition of oh it has this status and this message and then you can manually throw it like this that's kind of similar thing with uh, exceptions in in nest.js you kind of saw earlier with validation that it does do a little bit of the exception handling automatically for you right that's why we were able to uh, get a status 400 back when the validation failed, uh, but it also provides you a way to kind of create your own, you know, custom HTTP exceptions like this. And then, you know, you, there's also a bunch of these built in HTTP exception classes, right? Like 400 bad request, 404 not found. And then you, you know, anytime you kind of respond, you want to respond with those specific HTTP uh, status codes, you just throw the class. You know, so kind of similar thing they're doing on the left and right here. And then they do have a way for you to kind of globally define, you know, what I th I think of them as like catchers, right? They they capture a, a specific type of exception and then you can tell Nest how to respond. I think that's similar to what they're doing 
over here if i understand it correctly the the one where you do the handle so it's catching a specific type of error and you can tell it to respond a specific way so, so not really much to talk about here again basically they do the same thing a little bit of a different syntax but the underlying idea i think is the same uh, another thing i wanted to talk about quickly is uh, the different strategies for authentication on both sides in Adonis again this, it kind of has the same underlying idea is that uh, they kind of want to do authentication their own way so naturally that means that there's a limit to the different types of authentication that you can do so for example here I think they have documented how to go about you know looking up a user or a token in the database but they don't have any stuff here about you know things like social social logins right like logging with google or stuff like that i don't see anything here about that if you look at the adonis v4 documentation they do have some of that stuff so i imagine uh it's just too early for adonis v5 but again the the problem that i see here is that adonis again is trying to reinvent the wheel on a lot of places which ultimately slows it down as a whole right because he's the author is still trying to build all this other stuff so naturally he can't build everything he can only build a subset of what he thinks is uh, the bare minimum that you should have now on the nest side it just simply has a really good integration with passport js which has been around forever and as you might know passport has support for a wide range of authentication strategies, right? You've got your your socials like Facebook, Google, you've got uh, OIDC, you've got JWT, you've got, you know, login with password and username, etc. So basically, Nest kind of takes the stance of, I'm not gonna reinvent the wheel in this case. There's this perfectly good library that you can use that supports all of these different types of authentication you know go at it and i have tried this and you know it works great um so i'm not gonna write the code to do the comparison on both sides uh, i don't really think it's worth it because again they just have a completely different um strategy that you know you just have to understand um the limitations that you might have with adonis whereas Nest kind of just opens up the world to you. Uh, one section that I did want to kind of go back into the code to do some comparison is the database stuff. So again, a re reoccurring theme here with uh, Adonis is that they decided that none of the existing ORMs in the node space is good enough, so they made their own uh, called Lucid. So Lucid is kind of their primary way to do data models. I'll do a quick uh, demo of this in a second. And then they use Connects for the more custom query builder as well as migrations. So at least that's one place where I'm amazed they decided not to reinvent the wheel, which is a good decision because Nest is, is a very good library for this stuff. And then on the Nest.js side, it by default is database agnostic. It allows you to integrate with whatever database that you want. So the big choice here, I think, is usually type ORM for, for SQL databases. You know, as you can see, it's the first one that's documented because I do think it's the one that has the best integration with Nest. So I'll, I'll probably do a comparison of maybe type ORM and Lucid. So again, let's jump back into the code and let's see if we can do maybe a uh, a connection to a SQLite database. And let's see if we can do some queries off of that to kind of complete our user CRUD implementation. So we've got our Adonis code on the right again here. And we've also have our, we've got a code on the right and documentation on the left. Let's look into the setup instructions. How do I go ahead and use uh, SQLite? So it tells me that in my terminal, I need to install Lucid. So let's do that. And then after installs, there is a command uh, from the CLI node ace invoke at Adonis JS slash Lucid. 
and it gives me sort of an option to uh, pick what is your database. I'm going to select SQLite. You hit space to check a box here or a circle and then hit enter and then it starts uh, configuring stuff for me and then it asks me where do you want to display uh, instructions. Let's go ahead and select in the browser. I kind of want to see what this does. And it opens up this page. It just tells me uh, I got to provide my connection details via via environment variables. But for SQLite, I don't need that. So I'm just going to close this. It also noticed that it created me these files. If we took a look at config slash database, got my SQLite connection in there. And it's going to create this file that has db.sqlite in it. And I believe it did also install SQLite for me, right? So it's in my dependencies here. Now, before I can work with that database, I need to create a user table. So the way to do that is with migrations. So there's a section here about schema migrations, and it effectively just uses connects behind the scenes i believe it tells me that i need to do node ace make migration users and it creates me this file that has an up and down if you're familiar with migrations right that's usually something you'd see with an up and a down um, and it looks like i have to define my schema in this file so if i were trying to do a user table with a name column looks like I just need to do something like that right so I expect that this is going to create me a database table with incrementing ID which is a number and then uh, a varchar name which uh, I also want to make that not nullable because Users gotta 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 have a name, and then it tells me that before I run my migrations, I need to make sure to build. So I'm actually just gonna run my build script here, build successfully, and now I'm gonna run my migration node ace migration run. That says it ran, so I assume that means I've got a user table in my SQLite database, which is saved in a file. So let's go ahead and look into how to query that. So there is a query builder, um, which again, I think just uses connects. Um, so if you're someone who is very familiar with SQL, this is probably the, the way you want to approach querying things. So what Adonis actually promotes that you use, especially with Lucid, is the active record pattern. And the gist of that is basically that you will have these files, which represents um, your schema, your database tables, and then within these models, uh, you can also define custom methods if you want. So why don't we just go ahead and kind of see an example of this. So in the documentation, it says that I can do node ace make model user. I hit enter and it creates me that file and you just get back this base user model. Um, the one thing that is kind of odd is that it's it's not aware of what I already made in my migration. Now, maybe this is my own bias from type ORM, but ideally what it generates is something that already has the name field in it. But let's go ahead and define that ourselves. Uh, so we should have a public name string. All right, so now that I have that, I can start using that in my user's controller by adding an import which references that model. And then my, I can update this get all to be can do const users. Uh, since, it's, since it's async, we can await for user dot all. And that's going to do me. Uh, that's going to do my, you know, select star from user table. And we'll just return users. Now I can test this now, but I know it's going to return me an empty array. So let's kind of make our create more real by actually creating uh, or doing an insert. So there's a section here in the documentation 
under CRUD operations, we're going to look into how to go about doing a create. So it says that you can either instantiate the class and provide the values directly like this, and then you have to do a save or um, what I kind of like to do is this create method where I just do something like const user equals await user model create and then I pass in my data, right, my DTO and then I just return back that created user. All right, so let's kind of see this in action back in Insomnia. So back in my Adonis API here on slash 333, if I create a user with my name on it and hit send, it brings me back an object which has the timestamps as well as the ID. And just to check that this is auto incrementing, I'm going to do Marius2 here and do send. So I've got ID2 now on the right. Now when we switch to our slash get, get slash users, we get back those two users, right? So, so those two things are now working. Uh, and also let's update the rest of these methods to work properly. So the get by ID looks like we just need to do something like this with a user find and we pass in the ID. Right, and then we just return the user again. For updating, it looks like what you first have to do is query the user, make your updates. So for example, let's add a type here. Maybe we want to do request um, and say that we're trying to pull um, the name from the request, which I believe you do request that only name. So let's say that we're trying to allow the ability to update the name. So we'll get the name and then, you know, probably ideally you do the same validation in the middle here, right? Um, but we're just going to keep it simple for now. And then you can just do, if I understand it correctly, you kind of just manipulate the object and then we can just await user.save. And it looks like this just returns the user. So why don't we go ahead and just return that? Um, and this is complaining to me because again, it doesn't have the type for the, uh, the request body. Um, so maybe it is better to go through the schema again. So let me just copy and paste this validator so that, um, it provides me with a type. So let's do, and let's delete this. And we'll do user.name equals data.name. And I do like that it tells me it's possibly null because what if you didn't find the user, right? Um, I'm wondering if they have a find one or fail here, which they do. Uh, so we'll grab that. We'll change that to find one or fail. So what's going to happen here is if they don't, if the model doesn't find a user in the database. It's just going to return. It's just going to fail at this line and it's probably going to throw an exception. Uh, so it's never even going to get to this part. Right. And then I guess this question mark is no longer necessary. We just do return await user save. All right. And then our delete same thing. looks like you just find the thing and delete it. And we'll just return that. All right. So that's how you do basic CRUD with the models and Adonis using the active record pattern. Um, I did test this in insomnia. I'm not going to show it on the screen just to save you guys some time, but just trust that it works, right? It does the deletes that does the name updating and you've already seen the get all and get by ID and create, right? So that all works. All right. So let's go ahead and switch over again to nest.js to accomplish the same thing. Uh, and let's take a look at how that's different. So I mentioned with nest.js, it is very much database agnostic. Uh, you can do whatever you want. You can use whatever ORM you want. It has support for SQLize, Prisma. 
you can use mongoose with mongodb i think its main integration that it promotes is type orm so that's what we're going to use and this i think provides us a direct comparison to lucid but yeah do catch the point that adonis only has lucid so if you don't like that orm or if you want to do mongo i don't think that you can um you could probably hack it to work but um, it's not intended to go outside of that space. All right, so we got our red Nest.js code base on the right, documentation on the left. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go ahead and install uh, Nest.js slash type ORM type ORM itself and my database driver, which in this case is also SQLite. The next step I took is I made this new ORM config.ts file in the root, and I added this stuff, which basically just says I'm using SQLite, and here's my where my migrations will live, and here's where uh, the CLI will dump, will create new migrations. Um, I did have a recent video that talks about uh, type ORM in detail. So you might want to check that out if you want a little bit more clarification on what I'm doing here. But so I'm kind of doing it a little bit faster than usual. In package.json, I also added new scripts. And this is all covered in the documentation as well as in my previous type ORM video. But basically, um, there is a new script here that allows us to generate migrations and to run them. If you noticed from the Adonis side, they have a CLI kind of built in for that, right? They have their own commands. In this case, we just, um, there are commands for us to do this stuff through type or um, we're just creating NPM scripts so that it's a little bit easier. All right, so once I have all of that stuff, specifically this config, I then need to go into my root app module and I need to do a type ORM module dot for root and I need to pass in my config here which we're just gonna import from that file that I just showed you so that effectively allows me to connect to the database and then from there again kind of similar thing we need to be able to create our users table right so in the users directory we do have a user entity which is empty right now this is the class which represents effectively both the user model as well as the table itself. So it's a little bit different from the Adonis approach, but let me type some stuff here and it'll make sense in a little bit. So I'm going to mark this as an entity and then I want this to have an ID, which is a number. And I'm going to say that this is a primary generated column which by default is going to do auto incrementing IDs, kind of similar to what we did in the Adonis side. We said that we want a name and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to make that a basic column. And then in Nest, you can also do something similar with timestamps where you can do uh, created at created at date. And then there is a special decorator that you can use to do timestamps. So for example, there should be a create a date column and there should also be one for updated at, which is the updated date column. All right. And then what we're going to do next is once you have your, your entity, you can then generate our migration using our new command. So I'm going to do NPM run migration colon generate dash dash and then I'm going to provide a name so I'll just call this user right what happens next is it generates this new file for me if I look into it here's where the the direction kind of differs a little bit from type ORM and lucid is that type ORM allows you the ability to auto create your migrations if you wanted to, and you can do it manually as well. But I personally really enjoy the, the ability to auto generate it for you. So for example, running that command, it looks into all of my entity files 
and no, and it kind of does a diff with the database. So it notices that, oh, we don't yet have a user database which maps to this entity class. Let's go ahead and create a migration to create that user table. And based on the columns that I define here, it's going to create the same columns in the database. So you'll see a create table with ID or incrementing. It's got a name varchar. It's got created date time and updated date time. And you'll see that it defaults to now on create, right? So similar thing with migrations, except that it has the ability to kind of, uh, auto generate stuff for me. The difference, the core difference is that in type ORM, the, the model file, the entity class is sort of the source of truth of what is the schema, right? You saw that I defined this first and then ran my, my migration. Whereas in, uh, Adonis, the migration sort of becomes the source of truth of what is the shape of my database. All right. And we'll do a deeper kind of compare side by side. But first, now that we have this, let's take a look at how we can access this for querying in our application. So within my users module, I'm going to add a new imports here and I'm going to add type or a module that for feature, and this takes an array of entities, which I'm going to add user to. And what that basically allows me to do is within my service, I then now have the power to dependency inject this into the user service. So I'm going to add a constructor and within this constructor, I have this kind of special decorator that allows me to inject a repository of user. So I'm just going to call that users repository. which has a type of repository user and make sure to import user. All right. What that then allows me to do is I can start using that user's repository to do queries against my user table. And I forgot to add private here so that we have access to this as a property of this class. All right. Now that I have that, that means I can now start utilizing it. So how do we do our create? First of all, we do our new user equals this dot users repository dot create. And then we pass in our fields, which in this case is create user DTO, right? If you remember, it's just the name. And what this create effectively does behind the scenes that it does something like a new user. And then it, you know, it assigns the user that name equals DTO that name, right? Then once you have that in type ORM, the way we kind of actually officially save this in the database is through save. Uh, we take that new user and we save it. Okay. And then for find all this simply turns into this dot users repository dot find that's equivalent to doing a you know, select star from user and then kind of similar to the Adonis method. There is a, um, find one or fail here, which you can just pass in the ID, the update again, kind of similar strategy where you first need to query the user. So we're going to do a wait. So this should be async. Uh, we'll actually just reuse our uh, find one, pass the ID into that. So we're going to get back the user from this and then you can then manipulate that user. So for example, we want to do, we want to allow name updating. So we're going to do name user dot name equals update user DTO dot name and update DTO, DTO user simply extends create user DTO. So that has the same fields which is just name. And then same thing. We're just going to do a save this dot users repository that save user and remove kind of same thing. You query the user and then you do a remove. 
this dot users repository dot remove user and this should also be async all right so there is our crud and again i am not going to show the testing that this works just trust that it does um i do again have a type rm video where i show and explain a lot of this stuff in in much deeper detail so if you're interested in that make sure to check it out all right so let's go ahead and do a compare and contrast so the core difference i think when you kind of put these guys side by side is a lot of the methods from an api perspective are pretty similar right they got defined um right and they have find one or fail and then they kind of do the same pattern where you first query it and then do your updates or deleting you know it's effectively the same thing the core difference is that in adonis they prefer the active record pattern which the gist of that is that you're working with the model directly there's methods on the model like you have user that find in nest.js or with type orm um, it actually type orm actually does also support the active record pattern but for nest.js specifically they kind of promote the use of the data mapper pattern which is where you have a separate entity which in this case is the repository which kind of takes a model and then kind of um, allows you to work with it so instead of having methods on the model directly you're doing you're using methods from the repository and there's a there's an important benefit to doing it that way from a testing perspective because you know if you're able to do dependency injection right if you're thinking about this notice that we're injecting the repository of type user we're not specifically injecting the user model itself that means that in testing we can very easily mock the repository itself whereas in the active record pattern i'm not sure that you can do that as easily and again i think i mentioned it earlier that in the adonis documentation there's really nothing there about testing um so it's not clear how how much easier or harder it is to test the active record pattern in in this scenario so in conclusion would i recommend adonis over nest uh, i think this is a very heavy uh it's up to your preference uh, if it was me at least with what i currently see i would say no and for a very specific reason first of all uh, the v5 is in preview so it's not quite ready. You can use V4, which is already, which is actually pretty similar to V5. V5 just has a couple um, extra enhancements. But the the problem that I'm seeing with this framework is it's it's very much uh, an extremely opinionated um, approach to the solution. So. If you think about it, Nest and Adonis are effectively trying to solve the same problem, except that Nest is okay with utilizing what already exists. It utilizes what's already built by this amazing ecosystem of Express and Node.js, and it just focuses on the one thing that it needs to improve upon, which is application architecture, as well as the use of TypeScript. And they nailed that very well in my opinion whereas on the other hand adonis tries to reinvent the wheel in almost every possible space and in my opinion this just slows the whole thing down so there's actually this graphic that i'm going to pull up from the book essentialism and in that book they talk about this idea where your you know your energy is limited if you're splitting up your energy in all different directions like here on the left then naturally you just don't really progress as fast as if you just focused on one direction right and this is very much if i change the label here the left side would be adonis and the right side would be nest nest decided to just go forward and solve the problem that they think they needed to be solved whereas Adonis, which is pretty much run by one core author, um, 
has decided to really reinvent a lot of things. And I understand kind of the vision behind it, because if you kind of custom build the different components, then you, you can imagine that they're going to integrate very well together. They're going to have the same language. They're going to have the same design decisions and they're all going to come from the same author, right? So they're just going to integrate well. But it also means that it's just going to take a long time for this author to build all of this stuff from scratch. Um, and I don't think that's a good strategy in a world of open source where, you know, there's so many good engineers and projects that if you always have this stance of, I can do better, you know, you're, you're, I feel like you're just not going to get anywhere. With that said, I do think that the author uh, of Adonis, uh, I believe his name is Harminder, Mr. Burke. He's obviously an amazing engineer, right? The fact that he's able to build all of these different components, you know, himself, you know, think of any engineer that ha that knows how to build all of these different components. Um, that's pretty impressive. And he's already on V5. He clearly has fans. Um, so if you believe his vision, uh, the, his Patreon is here. Make sure you go support him. And he does talk about his vision a little bit more in here, right? So if you look in here, it does talk a little bit about sort of his reasoning about why Adonis should exist. You know, he, he, you can tell he's saying there's nothing yet in the space that really is similar to Rails or Laravel. So he's trying to emulate that as well as he, he talks a little bit about okay, why can't you just utilize existing stuff? Um, you know, in his case, it's a difference in values in his, in his uh, mind, it's better to kind of build stuff from scratch that integrates well together, right? So he's saying in theory, pulling packages from NPM sounds great, but making them work together is often uh, requires a lot of effort. But again, in my opinion, Nest.js is an example of pulling that off well. But with that said, I do believe that Adonis, once this guy kind of reaches his full vision for it, I think it's going to be an amazing framework. You know, all the stuff that he's doing where um, he's doing inversion of control through simply the imports like this, that's amazing. And if you kind of compare the code from this controller to this Nest controller, right? Like the nest code does get kind of a little bit bloated after a while with all of the decorators whereas in in adonis it's very simple it looks like you're mostly writing you know javascript um you know like basic javascript and it just looks very clean and nice but there again as you saw throughout the video there's just little things that i wish were better the documentation and stuff like that um, testing strategy and again it is in preview so I so I can't kind of say too much bad about it but I do think maybe in a year or two when it's fully released and uh, the community has had a chance to work with it I think it's gonna be a really good framework that you you definitely should keep your eye on but for today um, would I recommend it I don't think so would I recommend v4 maybe if you really like what you see in what i went over you know again v4 is still pretty similar so maybe you can start there but i don't see the benefit of jumping into v4 when it very clearly is about to kind of evolve into v5 and i don't know how much time um anyways yeah if you if you believe in this guy's vision make sure to support him anyways guys that was a super long video i think this is probably the longest video i've made so far if you've been with me throughout this whole thing, I super appreciate you. Uh, consider hitting the subscribe button if you want to see more of this stuff. And please let me know in the comments what you think. I very much appreciate all the comments that I've been getting. Um, it kind of helps me drive the direction of this channel. If there's a lot of people that like the Nest content, then maybe I make more Nest content. With that said, I think that's it for me. If you like this video, uh, hit the thumbs up and I'll see you on the next one.